Welcome back. I think you'll agree that we covered a lot of ground during our last lesson, particularly with respect to triads or chords and inversions. Today, we are going to explore the dominant chord a little more closely and tie the inversions from last lesson and today into a new and practical chord progression, which of course will transpose into various keys. I know that the coordination of these new techniques can be a little tricky at first, but don't worry, we'll get plenty of practice by applying these new skills in various musical contexts and pieces during the coming lessons. How about if we begin by playing our triads and inversions in several keys? Let's do each key with the left hand first, then the right hand, then we'll try hands together without stopping in between. Remember, if it falls apart when you get to the hands together portion, just keep one hand going and try to jump back in with the other. This skill will improve over time and with consistent practice. Let's begin with C major. Start with the left. One, two, here we go. Next, let's stay with an all-white key chord and try G major. Same thing, left hand first. I'm going to move my left hand down an octave. One, two, left hand. Right. a tip for doing this hands together. Don't try to move both hands at once until you are completely comfortable. Rather, move the right hand first, then the left. Just move them quickly so you can play the next inversion on time. You'll actually spot place your hands before you depress the keys. This will give you a chance to make minor adjustments to finger placement before you play a wrong note. We haven't done F major yet, but you'll recall that the F major chord is F, A, C. So it will feel similar to the two white key chords that we just played. So let's try F major. Let's start with the left hand. I'm going to start lower for this one too. One, two, here we go. Both hands. Now that we're getting warmed up, let's play a chord that has a black key in it. Let's do D major first. One, two, here we go. Right hand. Both hands. 
Next, let's play A major, since you also practiced it. One, two, here we go. How did those first five go? It's completely natural if they weren't perfect. The important thing is to practice them a little more slowly when you are on your own, and to try to keep going when you're playing with me. I like to practice C, F, and G major together because they have an all-white key pattern. For the same reason, I like to play D and A major together. Can you think of another major chord that has a similar pattern, a white key, a black key, and a white key for the root position chord? Did you come up with E major? Let's try E together with the left hand only for now. One, two, here we go. I'd recommend playing D, E, and A together because they are so similar. Your hands will begin to learn the feel of each chord more easily if you group like patterns together, at least at first. If we think of the keys that we've been learning and the five finger patterns, the only one that we haven't done yet is B. It's a little more awkward for most people, but it's a popular chord, so I'd like you to learn it. I'll show it to you now, and then you can practice it on your own before our next lesson. Here is B major. I'll start with my left hand. a few minutes working on your arpeggios next. Since these are just extensions of your chords, let's try the C major cross-hand arpeggio. One, two, three, ready, play. Let's do that again and try to feel and imitate where I'm accenting the downbeats. You'll notice that I'm stressing different notes on the way down. One, two, three, ready, play. How did it go? Usually in my classes, everyone does pretty well for the first few notes. Then we lose a few people at the crossover and even more on the descent. Not to worry. After you've practiced this on your own, you'll get the hang of it. You may even become an arpeggio aficionado. Just be sure to try it with me or your metronome after you've practiced it to make sure that you aren't pausing at tricky spots. I'd like you to see how this C major arpeggio looks on the staff, so you'll recognize it when you encounter it in your repertoire or etudes. Notice that there is an indication on the score that the left hand should play the top note. You'll also see that the exercise is in 3-4 time, and that on the descent, different notes fall on the downbeat, which is why we stressed different notes ascending and descending. Rather than overthinking this, 
Just listen to me as you play and feel three beats for me per measure. It will come naturally if we don't overthink it. Since we're looking at notes on the staff, I'd like to take a moment to address something that I didn't explicitly discuss in our previous lessons. But it has to do with the general rules for the direction of stems. Of course, like all rules, there are exceptions. But basically, any note on the middle line or above will have a down stem. Any note below the middle line will have an up stem. I'm mentioning this now because sometimes composers break this rule when they want to indicate that a different hand should play a note. This is not the case here, but before the end of our course, we may see a couple of instances of rogue stems that really indicate that we need to use a different hand. In fact, we may even see this in our next piece, the arpeggio etude. This piece will reinforce your C major arpeggio. Why don't you watch me play it for you? Did you notice that I simply played the C major arpeggio at the beginning of each phrase in measures 1 through 3 and 9 through 11? Did you also notice that my left hand crossed over in measures 3, 11, and 13? The only trick is that in measure 13, the left hand plays an A, just a step above the right hand G, not the C that we practiced in your arpeggio. The rest of the notes are played with the right hand. I'll let you work through this etude on your own before our next lesson. You can always review my performance on the video, if you need guidance. Next, let's check in on the 12-bar blues. Since we didn't play this together last time, I'd like to play the right hand first to make sure that you have the correct pitches and rhythms. So let's try the right hand together. Remember that the top three notes are quite close to each other on the keys. As you play, compare your performance to mine. One, two, here we go. ran into trouble, pause the video and review the problem spots. The combination of pitches and rhythms in measures 3, 7, 10, and 11 are tricky for many people. When you are ready, resume the video. Now, let's try it with the left hand. Remember to keep your left hand soft and the wrist supple. Here we go. One, two, three, four. I'd like to give you another option for this piece that might sound better to you, especially if you are still struggling to keep the left hand soft. How about if you play the left hand chords using half notes, so you'll play the left hand only on beat one and three of each measure? Let's try it and see how it feels. So just half notes in the left hand. One, two, three, four. So, 
how did your first blues piece go? Please practice it with both hands before next time. You can either play the left hand as it is written, or modified with half note chords as we just played it. Hopefully you'll be happier about your blues performance once you've spent some more time working on it. Let's take a break from playing and take a closer look at the dominant chord. Let's think about the key of C major for now. As we have learned in the key of C, the fifth scale degree is G. And to build our chord, we just stack up two more notes on top of G in thirds. Now, remember, when we first discussed the definition of a chord, we said that it could have three or more notes. Well, it's time to see what a four-note chord will look like. Actually, it's not too complicated. We just stack up another note, a third above the top note of the chord. It sounds like this. As you can see, I have to expand my hand to a seventh here. You'll recall that when we added figures to the Roman numerals to indicate which inversion we were playing, we counted intervals from the bottom note to the top note. So when you see 5-7, this simply means that it's a four-note chord built on the fifth scale degree or dominant, and that there is an interval of a seventh between the bottom and the top notes in root position. That's why we commonly refer to the 5-7 as a dominant seventh chord. It is one of the most common seventh chords that we encounter in music. Let's look at the notation for the inversions of this chord. Just as we did with a three-note chord, we can take the bottom note and move it up an octave, creating a first inversion chord. Now, because we have four notes, we need to add one more number to the figures. This is a 5-6-5 chord, because we have the interval of a sixth between the bottom and the top notes, and the interval of a fifth between the bottom and the second highest note. This is the inversion that we will play a lot throughout this course, so you'll get to know the 5-6-5 chord quite well. I'll come back to it in a moment. In the meantime, let's look at the next inversion. By moving the bottom note B up an octave, we get a second inversion chord, or a 5-4-3. You can see the intervals of a fourth and a third, and if we take the bottom note from the second inversion chord and move it up an octave, we get one more inversion, the third inversion. Remember, we have four notes in the chord, so there will be an extra inversion here. The third inversion is known as 5-4-2. Because we'll focus on the first inversion of the dominant seventh throughout this course, let's go back and look at it again. You'll see when I play it, that it is challenging to play four notes all at once, and to get them to sound evenly. So we are going to omit the least important note from this chord. If we look at the root position of this chord, you'll see that the G is really important, since it's the root of the chord, or its foundation, and it's how we know the name of the chord. It turns out that the third above the root is pretty important, too. It will help us to hear the difference between a major chord and a minor chord. We'll discuss minor chords, keys, and chords in an upcoming lesson. The seventh above the root is also important. Otherwise, it's just a regular dominant chord, not a dominant seventh. So, the fifth above the root, or in this case the D, is the least important chord tone. In other words, we'll still be able to perceive this as a dominant seventh chord, even if we omit the D. If we look at the first inversion of this chord and now omit the D, you can see how the 565 looks on the staff. I encourage you to get really good at recognizing the interval of a second at the top of this chord, and the slightly expanded hand position required for the interval of a sixth between the bottom and top notes. 
Let me show you how it looks and sounds on the piano. Can you try that chord with me? Let's do the left hand, since we'll be playing this harmony in the left hand later in today's lesson. Your pinky will be on B, your second finger will be on F, and your thumb will be on G. Now, I encourage you to keep what I call the top part of your hand, or the fingers that are higher on the keys, in place, and expand the lower part, or the pinky, of your hand. So try it with me. Five, six, five. Now, here's why the fingering is critical. We've learned that the most typical chord progression is dominant to tonic. So let me show you a tonic to 5-6-5 chord and then back to tonic. If you'll join me, we begin with our C major chord. Then to switch chords, we keep the top note in place, the middle note will go up half a step, and your second finger should be in place to play it. But simultaneously, the bottom note goes down by half step, so your fifth finger expands down. Let's practice going back and forth between these two chords. I'm going to do this over and over. When you get off track, just reset your hand and jump back in. Here we go. One, five, six, five, one. Five, six, five. Now, let's try that same progression, the one, five, six, five, one progression in C major with your right hand. The notes will be the same, but the fingering will be different. So, this will very likely feel different to you. First, we'll play the tonic chord. Then, the thumb expands down half a step to B, while the middle note goes up half a step to the F, which should be right under your fourth finger. I urge you to use this fourth finger for this, even if it feels weak, because I want you to learn the correct fingering and to use it consistently. The top note G stays the same. Try it with me. Just as we did with the left hand, let's go back and forth between these two chords until it starts to become a little more automatic. Here we go. Tonic, five, six, five, tonic. Here's how this dominant to tonic cadence looks on the staff. You'll want to try to recognize it, as you can expect to encounter it in your repertoire. Now that we've learned about the tonic to dominant seventh, let's learn an easier way to get from the subdominant to the tonic. We'll keep thinking in the key of C. If you look at this notation, you'll see that going from the root position C chord to the second inversion subdominant involves minimal movement. The bottom note stays the same, and the top two notes move up. To be more precise, the middle note moves up a half step, and the top note moves up a whole step. This will be important as we transpose this progression to different keys. Again, the fingering is different for each hand. Let's try the left hand first, since it's had a little break. Play the tonic chord with me. Now, keep the pinky in place. Your second finger is over the F, and gently expand your thumb up to the A. Now, let's go back and forth until you can play this progression with a little more ease. In your right hand, your third and fifth fingers expand up to the top two notes of the 4-6-4 chord. It will look like this. Try to join me if you can. Here we go. I'd 
I'd like you to get comfortable with these two cadences, the dominant seventh to tonic and the subdominant to tonic. But our ultimate goal for next lesson will be to link these cadences together into our primary chord progression. Instead of using root position chords, as we've done in the past, now we'll do the inversions that we just learned. I'll play it for you so you can see how it looks and sounds. Please practice this version of the primary chord progression once our lesson has ended today. Let's take a deep breath and do some shoulder shrugs. Then we'll review the Kohler melody, but in our transposed key of D major. Are you ready? Here we go. One, two, and play. I'd like to end our lesson by introducing another piece that I created for you called Summer Sunrise. In the left hand, you'll recognize several of the triads and inversions that we just learned. The melody includes many of the intervals and rhythms that we've been working on up to this point. I'd like to play it for you so you can follow the score or notation and hear how that translates into musical sound. Feel free to tap the beat or even the right hand rhythm as I play, but just listen this time. Since we don't have time to work on the piece together during this lesson, I'd like you to try to figure it out on your own using your practice skills. You might tap the rhythm of the right hand, then notice the intervals and circle any leaps of a fourth that you see. You could shadow the melody and finally play it until it becomes comfortable. When you think you have it, play along with the accompaniment track. Then practice the left hand alone until the chord changes are secure. When you feel ready, try it hands together slowly. We'll work on some of the musical details together at the next lesson. You can always go back to my performance to watch, listen, or even play along. Well, we need to stop here for today. I encourage you to get comfortable with your cadences in C major, and then practice the primary chord progression using the inversions that we just worked on. Because this progression will be a foundation for much of our upcoming repertoire, the more automatic the hand shifts and chord changes become, the easier our new repertoire will be for you to learn. So before the next lesson, please practice your 1, 4, 6, 4, 1 cadence in C major, the 1, 5, 6, 5, 1 cadence in C major, and the 1, 4, 6, 4, 1, 5, 6, 5, 1, or the primary chord progression in C major. Your goal tempo should be a quarter note equals 80. Also work on your chords and inversions in C, G, F, D, E, A, and B. These will be major triads. Work on your arpeggio etude, and learn the summer sunrise using the practice steps. Your goal tempo should be a quarter note equals 112. Improvise a melody over your left hand chord progression in C major, and you'll find an accompaniment track in your lesson materials. And remember to do physical warm ups, cool downs, and breathing. Review any older repertoire that could be improved too. I hope that you're able to get the new chord progression under your fingers and that you'll enjoy learning the arpeggio etude and summer sunrise. In the meantime, happy practicing. <laughs>